Good morning. Welcome to Bethany Baptist Church. We're glad you're here with us again this week. This morning's reading is coming from Job chapter 19. Uh, This is uh, in the middle of the dialogue that Job is having with his friends where there's a back and forth of trying to figure out why some of these things are happening. And uh, and Job is kind of wavering on uh, knowing who God is, but yet questioning why are uh, so many trials coming against him. And uh, at the end of chapter 19, we read these words. Job answers and says, Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead, they were engraved in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives. And as the last, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh, I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. And my eyes shall behold, and not another, My heart faints within me. Would you join me in prayer as we consider these words? God, we are so uh, grateful to be together again today and to, uh, in a time of uh, such uncertainty, uh, in a a day where we don't know what the next thing is going to be, um, we are so encouraged to see the words of such a great uh, man of faith who even in his questioning um, is reminded that you are God, you are Redeemer, and that at the end of uh, life, whether that is uh, naturally or whether you come again, um, God, we can echo these words with Job that you are our Redeemer and we will see you again. Uh, our eyes shall behold you, not another. And, and we are grateful for this reminder um, today, God, as we uh, continue to Uh, do life uh, separate in some ways as we continue to do life um, in just a a season that is difficult. Uh, God, we are are grateful for this encouragement that we find uh, today. We continue to uh, pray for one another, for uh, the members of this church. God, we're grateful that Even as we are apart, we can still do life together. I thank you for the many great blessings that we have seen in even the past few weeks. I thank you for the opportunity to meet together um, for some groups. Uh, I know for our student ministries, it's been such a blessing to be together again. Uh, I hear um, just the the blessing that it is for growth groups to continue to come back uh, and to start meeting together. We're grateful for those blessings, God. And we ask that uh, as... We continue to walk through this season that we would uh, have our full dependence on you, that we would trust in you, put our faith in you, um, and that we would be teachable and moldable uh, in these areas of um, the things that we just don't know what's going to happen next. Um, God, we are grateful for this time that we have together to come, to listen to your word, to uh, sing songs of truth about who you are, uh, and to uh, be together even if it is just through a screen. Uh, I pray that it would be a blessing to our heart, that it would encourage us and challenge us uh, in our walks and in our relationship with you. And we pray all these things in your name. Amen. Well, again, we're grateful that you're joining us today. Uh, Just a few things to uh, keep you aware of. First of all, we we know that... uh, we weren't sure what we were going to see for this week. Just, the, uh, just on Thursday, the decision was made um, that Marion County, as well as the rest of Oregon, would uh, go for a one-week pause. And so, uh, although we were hopeful that maybe we would be entering phase two, which would uh, uh, open some doors for us to meet together here back at Bethany, that has been put on pause for at least one week. And so, uh, we continue to wait in that holding pattern, but uh, we'll keep you apprised of any new developments. Our, our Shepherds team is meeting uh, again tonight uh, to talk about that, and so keep that meeting in your prayers. Um, And we will keep you uh, up to date as soon as we know word on what comes next. I also want to point out that uh, just yesterday uh, we got to celebrate a wedding of Jeremiah Puckett and Katie, now Puckett. And so big congratulations to those two. Uh, If you think of it through the week, uh, have opportunity, send them a a text or an email and uh, encourage them uh, in the, the next season that comes. And we're grateful for them. Uh, just one last thing that we have for you this week. Uh, you may have received an email from the church office that it is voting season. And so we are voting on elected officers this week. 
Uh, and we need those uh, votes in by next Sunday at the latest. And so uh, if you think about it this week, if you see that email, uh, we need votes uh, on our deacons and shepherds, as well as our financial officers. All of the information will be uh, in that email, as well as in this link here, copied below. So just click on that. It'll just take a few minutes and we'd be grateful for your input. Now we're going to continue our service with uh, music from our worship team.
us to your cross where we find life. Jesus Christ, shine into our night. Drive our dark away till your glory fills our eyes. Jesus Christ, shine into our night. Bind us to your cross where we find Well, good morning again. We're glad that you have joined us today on our online service. We are going to continue preaching through the Gospel of Mark and learning about the life of Christ as Mark presents it to us. And this morning, we're going to dive into one of the most pivotal texts in the entire Gospel of Mark and one that will be pivotal for our own lives as well. This text begins with a question that is put to Jesus' disciples, and it is perhaps the most important question that any of us can be asked. And that question is simply this, who is Jesus? Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And he wants his disciples to think about it, and he wants us to think about it this morning, because your answer to this question will literally determine the outcome of your life. But as we'll see today, it's not a one-time answer to this question that really matters, but a continual commitment to shape our answer to this question in accordance to how Jesus presents himself through his word. The way that we answer this question and the way that we continue to answer this question throughout our lives will determine the course of our lives. It will determine who we are. It will determine what kind of people we will be. John Calvin famously said, he said, nearly all the wisdom we possess consists of two parts, the knowledge of God and of ourselves. And later, Calvin said, it is certain that man never achieves a clear knowledge of himself unless he has first looked upon God's face and then descends from contemplating him to scrutinize himself. So if he's right about that, and I think he is, and if God has revealed himself through Jesus Christ, and indeed he has, then by looking at Christ and by answering this question about who he is, we will not learn only some theological fact, but we will learn something about ourselves too and the kind of people that we're going to be. So let's take a look at this passage together, and then we will work our way back through it. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Good God. Good God. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns.
Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. All right, so there are three main sections to this passage, and we're going to go through them one at a time. The first one in verses 27 through 30 is about Jesus' identity or who he is. The second section is about Jesus' intent or his mission, and this is found in verses 31 through 33. And then in 34 through 38, the third section, we will learn about how we are to follow Christ, how we are to imitate him. So let's start, though, with that first section in verses 27 through 30 about Jesus's identity and who he is. We read here in verse 27 that Jesus was heading with his disciples through the region of Caesarea Philippi. And this was a region just north of Galilee. And it was a it was known as a pagan area with a significant shrine to the Greek god Pan. And it's a place where sacrifices were made, pagan sacrifices. It's a beautiful place but with a very sketchy history. And this is where Jesus comes to reveal himself to his disciples, to challenge them on who he is. It's inter interesting. Jesus comes here and he confronts his disciples and essentially takes an opinion poll. He says, who do people say that I am? In verse 27, what was the popular opinion? What are people saying about me? And Jewish opinion about Jesus varied quite a bit. And the disciples here give three options. The first one they say in verse 28 is that they say that he was John the Baptist, meaning that John the Baptist had come back from the dead. If you remember back just a couple chapters ago, that was what Herod had thought. And that's what he was worried about. And this is understandable that people might think that Jesus was, was John because they, they had similar ministries, similar messages. They were around the same age. They were even biologically related. And so they might have even looked alike. And this might seem weird to us because we think, well, wasn't wasn't Jesus baptized by John? So how could they think that, that he was John? But if we read the scriptures, we see that the significant part of Jesus' ministry didn't really overlap that much with John's ministry. At that point, Jesus was a no-name, and people might have, might have forgotten about that. But the second opinion was that Jesus was Elijah. And the Jews believed that Elijah the prophet, because uh, the, the prophet from the Old Testament, because he was taken up to heaven and did not die, they believed that he would one day return. And indeed, the prophet Malachi at the end of the Old Testament had said that he would send Elijah before the day of the Lord came. And Jesus was kind of like Elijah. He was a bold preacher. He was a worker of great miracles. So again, not a huge stretch. And then the third one, it says, others say that you are one of the prophets. And what they mean by this is that he was one of the Old Testament prophets risen from the dead. Not Elijah, but another Old Testament prophet. And this was significant because most Jews in Jesus' day believed that the time of the prophets had ceased, that it was over. And so if they were willing to identify Jesus as one of the Old Testament prophets, then what they're saying here is a great honor. It's saying that they had never seen anything like him and they didn't expect to ever see anything like him again. The disciples, you'll note, don't bother telling Jesus what the Pharisees thought of him, that he was a blasphemer. They don't bother saying what the Herodians thought of him, that he was a, a political threat. They left out these, these negative opinions of the elites who wanted to kill Jesus, and they focused on the positive response of the people in the land. All three opinions that they shared here were positive. John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets, all were well respected by the people, all were used greatly by God. All of these are positive associations. Associations. And so what the disciples are saying to Jesus is that he's very, he's thought of very highly by the people of the land. This isn't surprising. Having read Mark, Jesus was very popular. He was well liked by the masses. But still, and this is what's important, all of these responses were wrong. 
All of these identifications were well intended, they were complimentary, but they were wrong. The popular opinion about Jesus was roundly positive and it was entirely wrong. You see, we can believe good things about Jesus. We can believe positive things about Jesus. We can have a positive impression of him in our minds and still be very wrong about who he is. This happens all the time today. Jesus is widely admired by a wide variety of people. Many, of course, see him as a good teacher. They see him as a moral example. They applaud how he spoke up for people that are on the outskirts of society. They love how he fed the hungry, how he healed the sick, how he challenged the leaders, all of these things. People think well of Jesus, and they think all these good things about him, and yet many remain wrong about him, because ultimately they do not give the answer that Peter gives. Jesus, after asking what the people are saying about him, he turns to his disciples and he says, what about you guys? Who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up for the group and he gives a short answer here in Mark. He says, you are the Christ. Just four words in Mark, but massively meaningful. The word Christ is from a Greek word meaning anointed one, and it translates uh, a Hebrew word, Mashiach, or what we know as Messiah. The Jews expected their Messiah to be the one sent by God as their deliverer, who would cleanse their sins, who would restore them to righteousness, and probably most important to them in that day, who would drive out their enemies and settle them in their land forever in peace. He was to be descended from David, and he would sit on David's throne in Jerusalem. And in Jesus' day, messianic fervor was high. They were, they were really expecting it to come. The Jews for, for decades had been held down by the Romans. Those living at that time, that was all that they, that, they, that they knew. They were tired of being held down by the Romans. They were tired of having only puppet kings with no real power. They were tired of having nobody to stick up for them. And they wanted this Messiah to come and fulfill all the great promises of their scriptures of a conquering king, of a great ruler, and now that Messiah is here. Peter has said this rightly. Jesus, is, Jesus affirms this. He says, don't tell anyone about it, again, so that the false information doesn't spread as a result of this messianic fervor. But here, with Peter affirming Jesus as the Messiah, this ends the first major section of the book of Mark. From the very beginning of the book, from the moment that Jesus appeared on the scene, people have been fascinated by him, and they've wondered who he is. And the, the first section in the book of Mark, the first major section, can really be summed up by the question that comes at the end of Mark chapter 4, after Jesus calms the storm and, and the disciples say, who then is this? Who is this guy? That's the theme of these first eight chapters of Mark. All right, Jesus heals all these people. He commands nature. He teaches like nobody they've ever heard. And everybody's wondering, who is this guy? And the responses of the people show that they're getting close in some ways, but they're still wrong. But now in Mark's gospel, Peter speaks up and he's the first person to get it right. And it's a beautiful answer. He says, you are the Christ. So much is pent up in these words. You are the Messiah. You are the one that we've been waiting for. You're the one who has prophesied for centuries. You are the one who will save us from our sins, who will give us final and full deliverance. You are the one who will usher in the kingdom of God and the end of days and will bring perfect justice and make all things right. And all of this is bound up in Peter's short statement. And it's all correct. Jesus was all of those things. Jesus is all of those things. So Peter is right in what he says. But even though he's right, he's not all the way right. In verse 31, we, be, we begin our second section of this passage, and Jesus here will clarify his mission. He will share with them what his intent is as the Messiah. Jesus and his disciples over the next few chapters uh, through the end of chapter 10, they'll have several discussions about this, and this is the first one. Jesus says to them, yes, you're right. I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. I am the promised one of God. I will do all of those things that you are expecting me to do. I will conquer the earth. I will bring perfect justice. I will sit on the throne of David. All that has been said of me in the scriptures is true. And so I will do it all. All of that was correct. But the scriptures said other things about Jesus too. The prophet Isaiah spoke also of a servant who would suffer for his people, of one who would die on their behalf. And the Jews hadn't understood that these scriptures were also about their Messiah. 
They thought that maybe it was talking about them as a nation or something like that. But now Jesus will tell them that all of those promises about one who would come and suffer, those are about the Messiah too. Those are about him too. In verses 31 through 33, he clarifies. It says, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. So Jesus here clarifies his intent as the Messiah. He has not come at this point to conquer kingdoms, not to conquer earthly kingdoms. He has come to die. He knows that this is going to happen. He knows that he is going to die, and he's not even trying to stop it. He says it must happen. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected and be killed, and after three days rise again. And Peter is so shaken by hearing this that he doesn't even seem to hear the last part that Jesus promised his own resurrection. He promised that he would rise again. He assured that his death would not be the end of the story, but he would even defeat that enemy. Peter doesn't get it because his whole world here has just been shattered. In Peter's mind, like like everyone else in his day, the Messiah was a conqueror. The Messiah was not a sufferer. So for Jesus to affirm that, yes, he is the Messiah, but then to clarify that this means that he will be killed and that he would let it happen, this just this does not compute to them at all. In fact, it was offensive. And you can see this in Peter's response. Note what he does. He rebukes Jesus. Peter took him aside, verse 32, and began to rebuke him. He's saying, you can't do this, Lord. Peter's going to stop him. Peter now knows better. Peter will do what it takes. Peter was the one to step up of all the apostles and to identify who Christ is. And now he is going to make sure that Jesus didn't misunderstand him. You did hear me, right? You are the Messiah. You do know this, don't you? And we see here that it's never a good idea to rebuke Jesus and tell him that he's wrong. In Peter's mind, the Messiah could not suffer. But in Jesus's mind, which was, mind you, the actual mind of the Messiah, suffering was the chief purpose of his mission. It was his intent. He had come to die. And Jesus addresses this very strongly with Peter. Because when Peter opposed this, when he opposed Jesus going to suffer and die, Peter was opposing God. This is why Jesus called him Satan. He said, get behind me, Satan. It doesn't mean that Peter was literally Satan or the devil. It doesn't mean that he was possessed by the devil. But in that moment, in attempting Jesus to not, uh, to convince Jesus not to carry out his mission, Peter was inadvertently doing the work of the devil. This doesn't even mean that Peter was unsaved, but it does show us that even a person who is saved can inadvertently do the work of the devil. And I think we all know that. If we have been in the church long enough, perhaps we have seen that a time or two. But Jesus takes this on quite strongly. He says, get behind me, Satan. In other words, fall in line, Peter. You listen to what I'm saying. You don't tell me what to do. This is my intent. This is my mission. This is my purpose. And he says, you are not setting your mind on the things of God. You are setting your mind on the things of man. Peter says this to, or Jesus says this to Peter, but we should hear it as well, right? Our priorities naturally come from the things of man, from the things of people, because we are people. We need to constantly renew our minds. We need to listen to Christ through his word so that we too might set our minds on the things of God. Christians still need this reminder. It comes throughout the New Testament, like in Colossians 3, 2, where Paul says, set your mind on things that are above not on the things that are on earth. Paul clarifies that we set our mind on things above because that is where Christ is seated. We need to set our minds on the things of God that are given to us through Christ. And so did Peter. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. We often have ideas as people of how things need to be accomplished. And it's typically through force, through victory, through power, through influence. But from God's perspective, many of the greatest things that will ever be achieved come through suffering. And we often fail to understand this. And Jesus' disciples certainly didn't get it. 
And here we see through Peter that they are like the blind man, that two weeks ago, the last time we were in the Gospel of Mark, when we saw the blind, the blind man get healed, you remember he needed to be healed twice. Jesus had healed him from complete blindness to where he could see, but he was seeing things blurry. And people looked like trees walking around and he wasn't seeing clearly. And now Peter shows that he is the same way. He sees rightly that Jesus is the Messiah. He's not blind. He sees him for who he is, but he's fuzzy on the vision. He's fuzzy on the details. But he's going to have to understand this because Jesus' calling will be his calling too. And it's the calling that Jesus gives to all of us. And we see this, he makes it clear in the last section, as we move in verse 34 to the end of the chapter, we see the third section here, which focuses on our imitation of Jesus and how we are to follow him. In these verses 34 through 38, Jesus says that not only is suffering the way in which he is going to accomplish his mission, but it is also the way in which his followers will in turn accomplish theirs. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He says that in verse 34. It was this sort of statement that made Dietrich Bonhoeffer say his famous quote, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Jesus says, yes, I am going to die. And if you want to follow me, then you will too. Jesus hadn't said how he was going to die at this point. He just said that he would be killed. But now he speaks not only of dying, he speaks of taking up a cross, a painful instrument of shame and torture. And it was the way in which the Romans executed their criminals. So not only would Jesus and his disciples not be conquering the Romans at this time, he would be killed by them. And he would be setting up his followers to do the same. Because to follow Christ is to die. Sometimes literally, that's what it would mean for many of the 12 apostles who were listening that day. But for all of us, it is a sort of death to follow Christ. It's a death to self. It's a death to our own desires. It's a giving up control of our life and handing it over to the one who has created us and redeemed us. The only way to follow Jesus is to take up our cross and do it. This means a regular, repeated dying to self. We need to understand what it means to take up our cross. I want to revisit that Bonhoeffer quote again in its wider context and see how he led up to his famous statement. Bonhoeffer said this, The cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ suffering which every man must experience is the call to abandon the attachments of this world. It is that dying of the old man which is the result of his encounter with Christ. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death, we give over our lives to death. Thus it begins, the cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. So we see there, as Bonhoeffer says, the cross is where we abandon the attachments of the world. It's where we die to self. We take up the cross in this. We imitate Christ in his death. And Jesus says, take up your cross. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. And normally, if you were following someone, you wouldn't want to take up a burden. That would keep you from following them. You don't want to get rid of any hindrances so that you're freed up. But remember, we are imitating Jesus Christ. And he will be carrying a cross too. And he will die on a cross. So if you don't have one, you won't be able to follow him. And this may sound daunting. This may at first seem to be one of the least effective evangelistic methods that you could devise. Come and follow me, Jesus says. And what does following, what does following me mean? It means death. It means certain death. It begins with death. Pick up your cross. Pick up your execution device and follow me. It doesn't seem like a great promise at the beginning. I'm reminded of the movie Napoleon Dynamite. You remember when, when Pedro was giving his speech for class president, he gave that great promise. He said, if you vote for me, all of your wildest dreams will come true. If you vote for me, all of your wildest dreams will come true. And Jesus here is essentially saying the opposite of that. If you follow me, none of your wildest dreams will come true. You have to die to your wildest dreams. You have to nail them to a cross. But, he says, your wildest dreams are actually your death. 
And so in the end, we see that by dying to self, by taking up our cross, this is how our life is saved, ultimately. In the end, it will not be a sacrifice. The invitation comes around and it shows us why this taking up the cross is worth it. Look at what Jesus says next in verse 35. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. And he says, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in return for his soul? Jesus says that to lose your life for his sake is to save it. And he says, you have an infinitely valuable soul and you should not sell that for anything in this world. But if you give up the things of this world and you follow Christ, you will receive a far greater reward than you can ever imagine. I was looking at some poll numbers about Jesus in preparation for this message to to see what people today are thinking about Jesus. And one thing that stood out in these polls was a question presented to people in, in a Barna poll. And he asked whether they had made a personal commitment to Christ. But what really stood out to me were, was the breakdown by income figures. Those who are making under $50,000 a year were far more likely to have made a commitment to Jesus Christ than those making over $100,000 a year. It's true what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, that God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. But it also confirms what Jesus warns against here in our Mark passage, that it is possible to gain the world and yet lose our souls. Instead, we need to gain Christ, even if it costs us everything. We should want nothing more than Christ, and we should not be ashamed of this. Jesus concludes this section by saying, For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is where things are put to the test. Jesus has challenged the disciples' view about him. They are right that he's the Messiah, but they think that this means he will be a conqueror. He says, no, in fact, I will be a sufferer, and they have to follow in these suffering footsteps. If they're willing to do this, they receive true life. But if they're not, if they're ashamed of this path, then they will turn away from him, and he will turn away from them at the last day, which is a reminder that that conquering peace is still on. It's just put off for later. So he says, if you're ashamed of me, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of you when he comes. And this is not about whether or not you forward that email that you get or you share that Facebook post. Though you always see this verse attached to those types of things. It's about whether or not you're willing to take up your cross and follow Christ and suffer for him when he calls you to do that. It brings all of this together. It's saying, are you on board with where I'm going? This whole passage we've looked at this morning is so important in the Gospel of Mark, and it's so important in our lives as well. It's important in Mark because it's a turning point here. Mark's focus so far has been on establishing who Jesus is. Now the disciples have figured it out. He's the Messiah. He's the promised one of God. He's the Savior and ruler of Israel and the world. But now he will shift to explain to them what that means, and that they're all wrong about him. They have misunderstood the Messiah's purpose. He's not come this time as a conqueror. He's come as a sufferer. And the next couple chapters will focus on explaining this to them further. And they're not going to really get it, though until after he himself has suffered. But this is an important text for us too, because the question that Jesus asks his disciples is one that he asks us. It practically jumps off the pages of scripture. But who do you say that I am? Forget popular opinion for a moment. Look at your own heart. Consider your own beliefs. Who do you believe that Jesus is? Everybody wants to co-opt Jesus. Everybody wants to have him on their side. I was curious myself about public sentiment about Jesus in our day and age, so I went to that great collection of public wisdom known as Twitter. And I went to their search bar and I typed in Jesus was, and I wanted to see what people were saying. And the three things that I saw that came up first were Jesus was black, Jesus was lynched, and Jesus was white. And what does this tell you? It tells you, because I did the search in early June 2020, it tells you that everybody wants to have Jesus on their side for whatever debate they're in. And since racism and racial injustice is a prominent debate in our day, both sides are recruiting Jesus to their purpose. And also all three of them are wrong. 
Jesus was neither black nor white. He was a Middle Eastern Jewish man, and so somewhere in between on that spectrum. And Jesus being lynched, that's a little closer to the truth, but still not true. Jesus was not exactly lynched, since a lynching is a mob killing without a trial. And Jesus had a trial. He had more than one trial, actually. And they were kind of sham trials. But even so, lynching in America has heavy connotations of racial injustice. And though Jesus' death was unjust, it wasn't an act of racial injustice. So all of these are wrong. And they remind us, you don't get to take Jesus and just inject him into whatever your cause is and put him on your side. He is above that. He is not your servant. He is your master. You are to submit to him and make his causes your causes. Now, just briefly, as an aside, does Jesus have anything to say to discussions about racism, injustice, and those types of things? Of course he does. Of course he does. We talked about some of those things last week uh, through different channels here at the church. Following Jesus means taking up your cross in every area of life and submitting to his example and teachings, even if it's hard. So if he says that you are to love your neighbor, you are to do it, no matter their race. This is a simple start, but it's one that would go a long way and one that we are all called to. But everyone, everybody wants to have Jesus for their own so that he'll be on their side, but Jesus doesn't work that way. You come to him in repentance. You lay down your own life. You pick up your cross or you don't come to him at all. Peter had ideas of what it meant for Jesus to be the Messiah. And some of those ideas were selfish. He no doubt wanted Jesus to conquer and he wanted to rule with him. And Jesus rebuked those ideas strongly. He reoriented Peter's perspective to one centered around redemptive suffering. And what did Peter do? He wasn't offended by Jesus. He didn't abandon Jesus at this point. He kept following him. He allowed his rough edges to get chipped off and formed more into the image of Christ. And that's an example for us. We shouldn't abandon Christ when it gets hard or when he calls us to something that we don't really get. We need to keep on with him and let him continue to shape us into his image. Peter, who had wanted to conquer with Jesus, would later, later write, Rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed, which sounds very familiar to our Mark passage. He says, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because of the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Peter got it eventually. Eventually he got it. Peter came to see that Jesus, though he was the exalted Messiah and the son of God, that he had come to suffer on our behalf and that it is a privilege to follow in his footsteps. That first Peter four text is just an application of Mark eight. Peter got it, but will we get it? Will we understand that Jesus is not just here to give us the life that we want? He's not just here to make us better spouses, better parents, better workers, better citizens, whatever it might be. He is here to have suffered and died for us because he loves us. Though he is the Messiah and the anointed one of God, his heart was and still is to save sinners. There's a mercy in the heart of Jesus that we cannot miss. The reason that Jesus was so intent on dying was because only by dying could he save us. By dying, he would take our sins upon himself and receive the punishment that we deserve. By dying, he would forgive us our sins and bring us back into union with God. By dying, he would secure for us all the blessings of heaven for all eternity. And now he asks us to take up our crosses and die with him. And this is not a one-time thing, though if you've never followed Jesus, that's where to start. Taking up your cross means repenting of your sins, aligning your life to follow his where it's not about what we can get, it's about what he has done for us. It's about what we can now do for others. And so let's all commit now every day to laying down our lives, taking up our cross, following in the example that our Messiah has set for us, trusting that in the end, having done so, will be what saves our lives through Jesus Christ. Let's pray now in his name. Our Father, we are grateful that you sent Christ not just to conquer and to bring judgment upon our sins, but to die on our behalf. I pray that you would help us to set aside our own, uh, just our own desires and to take up our crosses and to follow him every day, knowing that in doing so, we will ultimately not lose our lives, we will save them. 
God, we pray for anyone who has not yet followed Christ, that today would be the day that they would do so, that they would look at Christ, that they would take up their own cross, repent of their sins, and follow him, and trust that because he has suffered and died on their behalf, that they can be saved from their sins and be with you for all eternity. We thank you for that promise. We pray that we would walk in it daily. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for joining us this morning. Uh, we hope that it has been an encouragement and a blessing to you. Don't forget if you're visiting or if you have a prayer request to visit the website at www.bethanybaptistchurch.com slash check-in. Uh, and we would love to hear from you there. I want to leave you with these words as uh, we exit today. May the Lord your God, our help in ages past and our hope for years to come, be your guard while troubles last and lead you to his eternal throne. Go in peace. We'll see you next week.